Well, hello to everyone, and uh, it's great to have you out today, and I want to say hello to those of you who are watching via the internet. We are continuing on in our journey through a message series called, Why Can't I Change? What an appropriate message series, especially for the beginning of a brand new year. It's all about going below the surface. And that's why we have this iceberg image um, that is part of the theme of our message series. We've used the image of an iceberg because we have to dive down deep underneath, below the surface, so that we can gain an understanding of what is going on, so going on in, in our interior world, what's going on inside us. We've anchored this series in our verse in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. It says, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. The verse reminds us that all the change and transformation, all our spiritual transformation, our hopes to have real life change, it's all rooted in Christ. That is where we are going to experience true life change, that deep change that all of us long for. So what we're really dealing with in this message series is our soul. We're dealing with our soul. And we learned last week that the soul is the essential and deepest part of us. It's that part that integrates our will, you know, our heart, our thoughts, our feelings, all integrated and expressed through our body. And it's my soul that relates to God and to others. This is an important thing. And the quote that we heard last week, I love this from Dallas Willard, it was, you are an unceasing spiritual being, and we added the term enmeshed in flesh, with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. Wow, you and I are unending eternal beings. That is amazing to think of, and that we have an eternal destiny in God's great universe. Whoa, let's be honest. I don't know about you, but we don't spend a whole lot of time considering our soul or the state of our soul. Um, it's an essential part, though, and we really need to pay attention. This is how important it is. And we need to do some soul care because we've been discovering that, in fact, there's a huge connection between our emotions, how we are feeling, and our spirituality. They're connected, they're inter integrated. You cannot separate the two. And you can't be spiritually mature if you're emotionally immature. And that's what we have been wrestling with um, over these past messages. We started off the series, and most of you will remember this, um, we had a list of the top 10 sides of emotional immaturity. And we took this, uh, we've been using um, our teaching team has been using this book uh, called Emotional Healthy Spirituality by Peter Scazzaro. Um, and there's also other books that are recommended on the reading list you'll have in your teaching program as well. But we uh, highlighted this top 10 list of signs of spiritual immaturity. Do you remember some of those top 10 signs? If you don't, I'll just give you a little quick little refresher here. Uh, one of them was doing for God instead of being with God. Another one was using God to run from God. And another one, which is, oh, it's a fan favorite, I'm telling you, is judging other people's spirituality, um, uh, judging other people's spirituality. So we stand there and we judge and we say, huh, you're not very spiritual. Huh, what's wrong with you? And those are three of the 10 signs. But what's interesting is the number two sign and I found this fascinating, of the top 10 signs of emotional immaturity was ignoring emotions of anger, sadness, and fear. Anybody here ever ignore emotions of anger, sadness, and fear? You can put all your hands down. We all wrestle with this. In our culture, we are taught early in life you know, that if we display or even if we allow ourselves to feel those emotions, that it's actually what? It's a sign of weakness. It's a sign of weakness. I think especially as Christians, it's somehow allowing ourselves to uh, really feel those emotions and even express them is a sign that we're not spiritually mature. 
that we've somehow failed in our faith walk. Well, we're discovering that ignoring these emotions is actually a sign of spiritual immaturity. So this is a fresh look. I find this a fresh perspective. You know, that's why we're calling the title of this message Facing Reality, Learning to Deal with Losses Over a Lifetime. If you have your teaching program with you, you can follow along, and also there is a live event happening as well if you have a smart device with you up on version. We'll talk about facing reality. I'm a big one to talk about that right now because right now I'm facing a very difficult reality. We're moving. We are leaving Moncton, and we are moving away. Um, I have to face the reality that this is my last weekend here as the Brentwood campus pastor of the Journey Church. I have to face the reality um, that I'm not going to be here next weekend. I'm not going to be in this role anymore. And after next Friday, I'm going to be done. I'm going to be done. And you have to understand that while this is a a happy reason for this reality, it is still so very, very hard because I'm riding these waves of emotions, you know. I'm I'm excited about the adventure that God is is putting myself and my family onto as we move to Newfoundland and the brand new ministry chapter that's ahead. I'm excited about that, scared and excited. But then there's the other side. It means I have to leave my Journey Church family And this family is a family that I love deeply. And I have to also face a reality that just because of life circumstances, just because of situations that can happen, I may never see some of you again. That's my reality that I've had to navigate. And I know that you as well, as part of my church family, is navigating as well. So I have to say goodbye to my beloved church family. And this is a loss, and this is a grief, as my chapter comes to a close. And you're saying to yourself, you're one to talk about expressing your emotions, you're really, no, I'm, I'm holding on right now. <laughs> I'm gonna lose it later. <laughs> but this is a reality. And you know what, we all need to face the reality that there is a possibility, um, you know, that throughout all of our lives, we're going to experience losses. If we haven't already, we know we're going to. We're going to experience losses, and that's the reality. And it's in these moments, though, that we can, when we face into them, we can experience deep spiritual growth. We can experience transformation and life change. And some of these losses, these losses can be gradual or they can be catastrophic. You know, when I think of the gradual losses, I think of, well, we're going to lose our youthfulness. Gravity is definitely not my friend, and I know it's not your friend. No amount of hair color or gym memberships is going to stop the effects of aging. It's not going to affect, you know, and I'm not going to be able to get plastic surgery. No amount of that is going to stop you and I from growing old. So we, we have a gradual loss of our youthfulness. We lose our dreams, we lose our hopes and dreams. Dreams of a career, dreams of of marriage, dreams of having children, or the dreams that, if you've had children, um, that things maybe didn't turn out the way that you thought that they would. Or in your marriage, your hopes and dreams for your marriage, it just didn't happen. And so that's a gradual loss. Or we lose our stability in transitions. You know, routines are interrupted in the time between. And you know, right now I feel like our family is like, you know, this family of trapeze family, you know, and, and we're hanging onto this one side and we've got to let go and we're waiting and we feel like we're suspended in that time between. And when we have transitions, there is that sense of instability, that sense of, you know, what's going to happen next. 
And we lose our influence and our power as well as we grow older, don't we? We have less power and influence over our children, for instance. You know, the dream is, is that your children are going to grow up someday and, and hopefully move out. Well, we are lessening and lessening our power and influence over our children over the years as we get older. It's the same we lose our influence and power perhaps in our work, work situations or as we retire. These are all gradual losses that are a reality. But then there's those catastrophic losses. And believe me, in my journey with the Journey Church over these past 23 years, I have seen, we have experienced as a pastoral staff, catastrophic losses. You know, we've experienced when people have family members who pass away. You know, we were just talking about, you know, Jen mentioned in her prayer, about Blaine Campbell. This is the one year anniversary of Sandy's death. You know, that's a catastrophic loss. We, we, we lose a friend or, or a child to suicide. That's a catastrophic loss. Or a spouse has an affair, or there is a divorce, or there is a cancer diagnosis, loss of health, you've been laid off from your job. These are catastrophic losses. And what do we do with that? How do we handle that? Because the biggest challenges in our growing, in our walk with God, is to face what is real. The real losses in our lives and allow them to become part of who we are rather than just pretending that they don't affect us. And so today, we've highlighted, and you can see this in your teaching program, we've highlighted two, uh, met, uh, two uh, scripture verses, one in Ecclesiastes and one in John uh, the book of John. The Ecclesiastes 3 um, verse, it talks about how there are seasons in our lives, and you can go through that. It, you, know, you, know the, you know the song, To Everything, right? Turn, turn, turn. I'll try not to sing because I'm not paid to sing. But anyway, there's a season to everything. And when we take a look um, at verse 4, what does it say? Can you read this with me? It says, a time to cry and a time to laugh, a time to grieve, and a time to dance. There are times in our lives and seasons where we are going to cry, where we need to cry, where we need to grieve. But I'd rather just um, land on those last two, you know, the laughing and the dancing part. Dancing not so much in a Baptist church, but I'd rather just land there and stay there. But you know, that, that passage tells us that there are seasons where we need to express those emotions. And then now we're going to just take a look at the New Testament passage. And this one here I'm going to highlight a little more. It's found in John 11, 34 to 37. And here we pick up the story about Lazarus. And uh, you can read that chapter, that whole chapter in 11 is the whole story about it. But it says early on in the story that Jesus was really, really close friends. It says that Jesus loved Lazarus, and Lazarus had two sisters, Mary and Martha. He was a real close, close friend of this family. And Jesus loved Lazarus, Lazarus deeply. And so we pick up the story that Lazarus had gotten sick, and he, in fact, had died. And in fact, we pick up the story in these verses that we're going to look at, where Lazarus has not just been dead for one day, but it's four days. It says four days he was in the tomb. So the reality was, Lazarus was dead. So Jesus has arrived, and he enters into this scene of deep grief and loss. And we pick it up in verses 34 to 37. And it says, Jesus is asking, he says, where have you put him? He asked them. And they told him, Lord, come and see. Then Jesus wept. And the people who were standing nearby said, see how much he loved him. But some said, this man healed a blind man. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? You see, this story of Jesus outside the tomb of a very close friend who passed away is the story of Jesus grieving. It says that he wept. He didn't deny that his friend was dead. He wept. 
He was sad. Jesus could weep at the graveside of his friend. And you know, it's so interesting in some of the readings that I've done and, and taking a look at this passage, there are some writers who say, oh, Jesus wasn't really grieving the loss of his friend, don't connect that, trying to make Jesus an emotionalist, an emotionalist savior. But he was emotional here. He expressed his grief and loss. So the question is, why can't we do the same? Why don't we do the same? And then when you think about it, when you go on, what happens uh, in the rest of the passage? What is going to happen in just a few minutes? What is Jesus going to do? He's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. And yet, even knowing he was about to do this, all for God's glory, he still experienced a deep sense of loss. I think that is something to be noted. So the question is, how do we integrate grieving and loss with our faith? What does it mean to integrate our emotions with faith and my walk with God? This is a good question. Because we will grieve, and how we all grieve reveals our emotional maturity. Because actually, if you're following along, we're going to just run through, there's actually, there's, there's good grief and, and there's bad grief. So I just want to highlight what the bad grief um, traits would be. With bad grief, well, this is, this is someone who would be in denial. That is a sign of bad grief or selective forgetting. Now, I have this great illustration. It's actually in, uh, in the book. Um, Queen Victoria of England lost her husband, Albert, when she was 42. Obsessed that nothing would change, she continued to make Albert the center of her life. For years, she slept with his nightshirt in her arms. She made his room a sacred room to be kept exactly as it had been when he was alive. Every day for the rest of her long life, she had the linens changed, his clothes laid out fresh, water prepared for his shaving. On every bed on which Queen Victoria slept, she attached a photograph of Albert as he lay dead. That is being in denial. That is not being in, not, that, that's, wow. And I think that we can be in denial as well when we're facing losses. And we can just pretend that it didn't happen so that we don't have to face in to that grief. Or um, another sign of bad grief would be stoicism. You know, we can be stoic. We all know the stoicism. And depending on the culture that we're in as well, that's, that sort of shapes how we find ourselves expressing uh, grief. So when we're faced with a loss, we put on a brave face. You know, I can remember, um, you know, being at funerals and having someone say, uh, observe someone who was crying and, and have someone say, oh, well, look, there's the official mourner. <laughs> right? There's the official mourner. That the value was in being stoic. The value was in being strong and being brave. We're, but, you know, because, of course, we're supposed to rejoice in the Lord again, and we're supposed to always rejoice, right? We say, I'm not worried. Um, I'm not worried about what just happened. That doesn't bother me. I won't allow myself to go there. I'm just fine. Thank you very much. You know, it's, it's all part of being in denial, but handling it with a brave face. And I think sometimes we can even feel ashamed. You know, I can think of many situations where, where losses have been rationalized and minimized. You know, we have people who have experienced a deep loss, and they come up to me and they say, well, well, Pastor Carolyn, you know, compared to what others are going through, it's really not much. And that's a way that we can avoid entering into our grief and pain. Um, another sign of bad grief is addiction. You know, uh, we binge watch a series on Netflix, you know, we try, we come home, um, uh, we just lose ourselves on the internet, spending hours maybe on Facebook, or viewing pornography, or we work long hours, um, and late hours, we eat all the time to help, you know, help us with, with, uh, with our grief, or we sleep all the time, or we drink our pain away, or we take pills and medication. How do we deal with grief to try to escape it? Or we expect someone else to take our pain away. And finally, what happens when we are immersed in bad grief? We just get stuck. We can get stuck. And you know, um, 
it, there is uh, highlighted in one of, one of the small group, journey group questions, it talks about the five stages of grief, right? And, uh, and we can get stuck all along that journey of grief. We get stuck, we can stop moving. We stop moving through it. And then our souls can shrink and our spiritual growth gets stunted. It stops our growth. But you know, in the midst of our losses, whether they're gradual or catastrophic, the way to enlarge our souls, remember this is all about our souls, is to move towards allowing our emotions to be integrated with our walk with God. We move towards good grief. There's actually good grief. The ultimate goal of good grief is that we can actually open up our lives, we can be honest about the hurt and about the losses that we have um, experienced in our lives, but we can allow God, we let him enter into that time of loss. It's so interesting how we're okay in you know, praising God and acknowledging him through the times of blessing, but we just want to, or we sometimes think he's not there in the pain. And we just say, well, I guess he's not here. And so, with good grief, we're actually saying, no, 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 he's with us. How can we integrate our faith and our walk with God in light of our losses and that we're all going to experience them? So let's take a look at signs of good grief. The first sign is to be attentive. Um, instead of burying, stuffing, avoiding, minimizing, um, we can acknowledge and invite God into our loss. We can actually cry out to him. You know, there's the story of Job. We all know that story, right? Where Job experienced catastrophic loss, and one of the responses that was offered to him, it was actually um, by his wife, right? It was, curse God. Curse God and die. That was her recommendation. But the difference between a curse and a lament is we can lament to God, we can cry out to him, we can invite him into our pain. You know, the Psalms is filled with laments. I think of uh, one of the King David Psalms, Psalm 55, he cries out to God in his distress and lament can lead to healing. When we invite God in to the time of, of our pain. Another sign, another thing to uh, have good grief is to wait. Oh, we love waiting, don't we? No, no, not especially when we're experiencing loss and grief. We don't like to wait. Psalm 37, 7 says, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Or Psalm 27, it says, yet I am confident I will see the Lord's goodness while I'm here in the land of living. Wait patiently for the Lord. Be brave and courageous. Yes, wait patiently for him. Dr. Paul Tripp said, grief blocks my ability to see God, but I shouldn't conclude that that means he's absent. We don't like to wait. We just want to move through. We want to get through the loss quickly. We don't want to be in that place. We, we even look at some, you know, who we've seen who are maybe lamenting and grieving the loss of people maybe over years, and we say, what do we say to them? Get over it right? Suck it up. Move on. Get moving. This is what we say. And we might even say it to ourselves. We think, what is wrong with us? We should be over this by now. And you know, there's even another really sad and shadow side to all this. We can actually think we're being punished in times of waiting. Whenever we're tempted to connect punishment with loss and times of waiting and times of grieving, my goodness, we've got to just look at the cross. Jesus took the punishment. We're not being punished. He took it all. He took the punishment for us. Another sign of good grief, that we're moving towards good grief, is when we embrace our limits. You know, losses are really limits, aren't they, when you look at it? This was a fresh perspective for me. I thought to myself, yeah, that's, that's really true. Um, but we don't like to admit or embrace our limits, do we? No, in fact, I think some of us say to our kids, oh, you can do anything. You can be whoever you want to be. We do not place uh, or express any limits uh, for our children. And we have some theology out there that, you know, that we can see on, on some of the uh, on television networks that say, you know, you can have it all, do it all, be, be all you can be, right? 
we don't like to think that life has limits. But let's just take a look at this for a minute. We're all limited in one way or another. Our bodies have limits. We've just talked about that. Our intellectual capacity is limited. I know you'd like to think that you're all, you know, brilliant IQ, high IQs, but we all have limited intellectual capacity. Our gifts and abilities are limited. You know, Jesus was the only one who has all the gifts. We might have a few, but he's the one, right? Um, being married or single is a limit. There are limits on the number of children you can have, believe it or not, for some. Maybe they don't think there are limits, but there are eventually. We have limited resources. I mean, we don't, even if we have lots of money, there's still a limit. And we certainly have limited time. Because pretty soon, our time is going to run out. So we are limited. And those are losses. We can see them as losses. And part of growing up emotionally and spiritually is actually acknowledging and accepting our limits, and quite frankly, accepting the limits of others as well. Because there's nobody perfect. There's nobody, nobody. We can't have it all, we can't do it all. We need to embrace and accept the reality of limits in our lives. And finally, if we're gonna move into good grief, this means that we will find ourselves growing. We can allow ourselves, um, when we open ourselves up to uh, actually you know, integrating our emotions with our faith and walk with God through times of grief and loss, we will grow. We will grow spiritually. You know, we all face many deaths within our lives. You know, deaths of dreams, we've talked about that. But the question is, will we allow God to work in us and through us during our times of loss? And it's neat, in James 5, um, the story of Job is actually, it's held up as an illustration, you know, of someone who's actually persevered and endured, um, having experienced catastrophic losses. He suffered, and he endured through the suffering and loss just so he could experience the compassion and mercy of God. Because what happens next is God blesses Job many, many times over. So we can face into grief and loss in a way that allows our faith to become part of it and we we'll grow spiritually. And you know that Romans 8, 28 verse, we all know that verse that says, you know, that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. It's not that, that all things are good that happen to us. It means that God is gonna work all things together, the good and the bad, the losses and the gains. He's working it all together for good for those who love him. So we can face reality with hope as we experience the losses in our lives. We can include God in our loss and we too can experience that compassion and mercy of God when we let him in. And we can face that reality with hope and I'll tell you why. Can you guess why we can face that reality with hope? We can face that reality with hope when we just look at Jesus. When we look at Jesus, we look at the cross. He who had no sin, right? He who had no sin, he suffered and he died. We look at the cross and we see the suffering and we see the loss. But you know, we also see the hope because of the resurrection. Without Jesus experiencing that suffering and death, there would be no resurrection. There would be no new life. And I love what it says in that 1 Thessalonians passage, 4, starting at verse 13. It says, Now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died. So you will not grieve like people who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised again to life, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring with, back with him the believers who have died. We, if we've put our faith and trust in Christ, and if we've integrated our faith in the midst of our loss, no matter what, if it's a gradual loss, a catastrophic loss, we do not grieve 
like one without hope. That is what the, the promise is. Will you and I believe that God wants to grow our souls in the midst of our losses? This is the, this is the challenge. Because you can get bitter. That's, that's a, an avenue we can go down. But when we integrate our emotions with our faith in him, it moves us into a deeper and a more mature relationship with God. And this means that we just need to do some acknowledging. We have to face reality. Acknowledging that life will have trouble, right? Jesus said that. In this life, you will have trouble. But what did Jesus say next? But I have trouble overcome the world. In this world, you will have trouble, but I have overcome the world. This is the good news. And so that means when we have trouble, when we have losses, we can truly weep, we can truly be sad, and we can truly hope. And the loss enlarges our soul. And this is our journey towards change. The question for us today is, can you and I say, it is well with my soul? Can you and I say, it is well with my soul? And we all know the story of that song, that it's a celebration of faith in the midst of tremendous loss, and you can go and you can look it up online and read the whole story of Horatio Spafford. But yet the writer of this timeless song could say in the midst of it all, it is well with my soul, and why? Why was it well with his soul? was well with his soul because he knew that God loved him. He only had to look at the cross of Christ. There was his evidence. And as followers of Jesus, we too have this hope that we do not grieve like those without hope, that because of what Christ has done for us, ultimately the pain and the suffering and the loss that we've all experienced, whether we've had a short life or a long life, it will eventually end. Can you say hooray? Hooray. That's pretty good. Hooray. Pastor Carol's been talking about grief and loss. <laughs> this is her final message. Hooray. The resurrection hope. This is where we're at, right? This is where we need to go. Because of what Christ has done for us. Our souls are well when we put our faith and trust in him. Is it well with your soul today? Have you taken that step? Have you put your faith and trust in Christ? The cross says that you and I can have hope in Jesus and that we can still grieve, and we can have hope in the midst of losses in life. Because guess what, folks? Our losses are real, and so is our God, our living God. Let us pray. Lord, this has been a difficult message. This has been heavy. Lord, we don't like to go there. We don't like to enter in to our pain that we experience because of loss. Lord, it's, it's, it's counterintuitive. We want to run away. We want the pain to go away. But we can respond in so many ways. You know, we can avoid, Father. We can deny. We can try to medicate ourselves. We can just... We can just stuff it deep down, but Lord, we know that it's buried alive there and we'll come out in unhealthy ways. So this is important for us, Father, to allow you to enter into our pain and grief. Father, I know there are people here and I know for myself, you're calling us to face some pretty tough realities. And they could be realities of gradual losses or the reality of a catastrophic loss. Lord, you're calling us to invite you in. And you are there in the midst of our grief. Whether or not we acknowledge it, Father, you are, your presence is with us always. Help us to acknowledge the truth that you are there. You are here. You are with us. And you care. And Father, if we ever doubt that, Lord, just point us to the cross. Remind us that in spite of our circumstances, in spite of our losses and grief, God, those circumstances 
have nothing to do with or are connected with your love for us. We get that so twisted, God. You want to renew our minds in this issue. Remind us of your love for us and that Christ's suffering and dying was necessary for us to be able to share in his resurrection power. We get to share in that, Father, that ultimately we have that hope that regardless of our circumstances, Lord, we have that hope. We do not grieve like those without hope. So we invite you, Lord, tonight, today, to enter in, enter in to our pain. We invite you, Lord, and we can cry out to you honestly, God, because you already know what's on our minds anyway, so we can just, we can just stop pretending everything's okay. And we can allow you to minister to us and we can allow the comfort of, of our family of faith to minister to us as well. We don't need to put it on. We don't need to put on a mask. We don't need to be stoic. We don't need to try to be strong, God. You call us, Lord, to actually integrate our emotions with our faith. So, Lord, give us hope today in the midst of of the suffering and loss that each of us has experienced in the past or that we are facing today. We ask all of these things in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Well, in light of this being my last time being on this stage for this service as the Brentwood Campus Pastor, as part of our benediction, I'm going to get everybody to stand, please. And we're going to recite these two verses of a very old hymn that's called, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. We're going to read them, and then I'm going to invite, the band's going to help us, and we're going to get to sing them. Okay? So let's do this. We can do this. We're going to put those um, lyrics up. Here we go. Let's say this together. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. When we asunder part, it gives us inward pain, but we shall still be joined in heart and hope to meet again. Let's sing that. My mic turned off. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love, the fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. When of our tie that we have, because of our faith in Christ, that will be the connection that we will have now, as we go, and forever. God bless you, amen.